Very nice. Happy uh, December. Mm -hmm. No kidding. So, Jeff. Dave. We're wowsing. Is that good? Uh, I think so. Hey, Peggy. Someone's out. People are paying attention. Oh, all right. We got to step up our game. Hello, everybody. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and I should go ahead and turn on. If I, if we're streaming, I'm gonna I'm gonna do the whole thing. Shall I send them to the Wowza link? Uh, it should work at edtechtalk.com/live. Let me confirm that. Indeed, it does. So you can send them there. Uh, and sound is okay, Peggy? Oh, good. And you will have no commercial interruptions whatsoever. Hooray! Yay. Tell us all about Wowza, Jeff. <laughs> Even the typing sounds great. Tell us all about Wowza. Well, when you guys had your first date, uh, change eleven people with the uh, DTLT people, uh, I heard them talking about using Wowza on an EC2 Amazon server, and I thought, well, that sounds nice because there's no ads and stuff. So I went about giving it a shot, and it was not hard but a little bit confusing first time out so I set up a meeting with Tim Owens of DTLT to kind of show me the ropes which he did and posted that recording to um, uh, I hate our chat room this is the missing piece of the puzzle anyway I was gonna put that link in there and I can't paste it into our old add-on chat um, but it's at jefflebo.net. Anyway, he showed me how to do it, and so now I'm doing it. Uh, and so I've got my little Amazon EC2, and the way this works is I pay about 15 cents per hour, uh, plus a few little uh, $5 a month, and a few little extra fees here and there. Um, so it's not free, but it's not very expensive. And uh, you can set the quality of the stream. You can control your own live interactive webcast with no ads because that, that was the incentive because live stream and Ustream and all of those always interrupt with interstitials and other yucky ads. Well, that's cool, Jeff. Yeah. If only we had a chat room. Yeah, and I think what they use is IRC, and I think I'm ready to, to take that step as well. Um, we did that before. Why did we abandon it? Somebody didn't like it. There was a general revolt in the attackosphere. It seems pretty user friendly. Like people. Hey, I it. agree. It was my idea. Um, and I don't know if there's automatic archiving and that kind of stuff, but um, is the video streaming free? No. It's five dollars a month, plus fifteen cents an hour, um, and plus a little extra if you want your own elastic IP, so you don't have to change the interface every time. <laughs> the IRC, what would be involved in paying for an IRC room? We don't have to pay for it; just set it up. And that's what I was hoping you'd say. Mm -hmm. So we should look into that because I'm, I've had it with this chat room. Uh, Oh, Kmon is ignoring themselves. That's good. I can see that. Um, so what's up? So Dave? it's a street. This is EdTech whenever. It's December 4th or 5th, depending where you are. <laughs> and we have declared snow days for the last three or four weeks uh, because the whole game. We're showing a crisis. Show's in a crisis. <laughs> crisis mode. We're always in a Panic. crisis. Panic. Uh, but I said, okay, I'm going to stream one way or the other. 
and Dave actually showed up and called me on it. So here we are. <laughs> well, I did want to see your new setup, which is kind of cool. Um, how's the the stream plan for you? One issue is you're pumping it out. I'm pumping it out at a certain bandwidth, and if your bandwidth isn't strong enough, then you'd probably get buffering issues. You I get some chop. You got some chop? Yeah. You can set it up where you're putting out a few different streams. Of course, it uses more upload bandwidth, but uh, people would have the, it would automatically detect bandwidth or something. And it's more upload bandwidth. Of course, it's frozen with me on the page, so I don't mind so much. Oh, that's because it's only you and me in the Hangouts, so I have to click on me if I want to be seen. But it's kind of early here, and I'm was up till 3.30 a.m., so I may just leave it on you. What were you doing? Um, what was I doing? I was doing some... It's the end of one session here and the beginning of another, so I was doing some paperwork. I was uh, working on Korea Bridge a little bit. Just keeping the wheels moving. Just doing my geek thing. Let's do the geek uh, thing. So how are your assorted geek things? Um, you know, things are going well. I'm um, still working on trying to make um, some kind of way to explain higher education to people, which is uh, my day job. So that's the, what, the, the what, nuts what, and what bolts of higher education. And well, I, I'm amongst the responsibilities I have at the university, I'm responsible for the university's web presence. So when you try to define higher education, it runs you into an awful lot of trouble because higher education is not just classes, right? There's, I mean, just staying with a student and staying with a normal student, if we can find one of those, you're talking about somebody who is 18 years old, uh, has scholarships and funding and fees and events and student union and um, lots of tests that people are trying to give them and... Uh, surveys and all the rest of this stuff. So we, we pummel those uh, individuals with all kinds of content. And nobody really understands any of it when they start out. So they don't understand any of the language of their classrooms, nor do they understand the language of the university. To complicate that, the university is also, in many ways, a business. So for instance, there's almost no universities that don't rent out their space at this point. So they rent out their auditoriums, and they rent out their track and field uh, infrastructure in order to help support uh, the goals of the institution. And my experience has been that for the most part, that's exactly what it is. It's about trying to support the goals of the institution. Unfortunately, when you have such an incredible variety of clients, it means that talking about higher ed is really complicated, right? It's one thing when you're just talking about the learning aspects of it or a particular kind of learning aspect. When you've got to do it all at the same time, it brings up a lot of competing goals and stuff so that's that's the I would say half of what I do at the university is uh, is that when you say it and it sounds like it's been a little challenging who are you explaining this to that's the particular challenge I'm, I'm trying to get the website to explain itself it's no problem if I got somebody in front of me and I can walk them through it and I can sort of figure out where they're at and stuff but you know the website gets I don't know hundreds of thousands of hits, right? So there's lots of people coming in from lots of different areas and they all have different goals and different things they're trying to get done. So it's a, it's a real challenge to try to balance all those things and balance the politics and stuff. So that, um, I don't talk about that on the show very much, but really when you look at education moving forward and you look at the way that the technology is becoming more and more central, not only from a classroom experience, but from a broader sort of uh, institutional perspective, um, you know, when we're competing more and more against larger institutions, more and more against online institutions, um, there's some really big sort of points of competition there. You extend that one step further and you look at what stuff like the University of, um, University of America, I think it's called, um, and uh, the University of Phoenix's, those guys, the things that they're able to provide for their students from, um, from a technical perspective are really things that we can't compete with. So as an online student at an institution that's got its act together, they can tell you exactly how you measure. Like the University of, of America, I think that's what it's called, has 85,000 students. And they can tell you at any given time where you rank among those 85,000 in the most likelihood of you dropping out of class. 
or how you're doing again like at the signals project in at Purdue how you're matching up against the other students in your classroom or across all of the students who are taking a specific course particularly useful for like first year students if you're in biology uh, one of those big big classrooms there's a lot of that infrastructure that you can pull together to try to give students a sense of where they're at from a at least from a statistical perspective and it's not just grades wise but attendance engagement all of those things but in order to get that work done there's thousands of hours of backroom discussion that needs to happen at the institution to pull people together to do that stuff. So and that's, were there any particular discussions recently that uh, caused you to lead your answer to what you've been up to with that? Because this is part of your day job. This is what you've been doing for it's been part of your day job for a while. Why this week did it come up? Well, this week I've really I've come to terms with um, with I, I'm sort of a lot of the work that I'm doing is coming to a whole is coming together so for instance this week I tried to write um, demonstration scripts uh, or use cases for um, the student information database people who are coming to visit that say okay so what could I possibly want to know ever about a student to find out how I can support their success so assuming that I can have anything Assuming I can have whatever I want to know about a student, what do I want to know and how can I help that student? So, for instance, let's say that you are the manager who's in charge of training the people who do first year advisement for first year students, first time, first century, 18 year old kids coming to university. Some of that is about preparing kids for studying and that stuff, but a lot of it isn't. Right? A lot of it is just helping them make good decisions, making them practical decisions, separating what they want to do from what their parents want them to do, those kinds of things. Right. So if I know, if I can ask the computer system, what is the likelihood, what, what course combinations lead to the highest likelihood of students failing? So if I find out that if you take Business 101, English 101, and Psych 101 in the same term, you have like a 50% higher chance of failing. That tells me a great deal about the likelihood, you know, the, the sort of, it gives me something I can talk to the student about. From a next perspective, if four months four months later the student's in the system and we find out that the student is, their grades are dropping, but they're not touching any of the academic support systems inside campus. So maybe it's have that, send an email to the person who does those, so that person reaches out and goes, hey, we know, you know, is there something we can do to help you out? You know, we have these sessions on Wednesday, maybe you'd like to come out and meet with the rest of us and we can talk about this. Um, now there's a whole bunch of other questions about whether we should be doing that and and I think of those as being completely separate discussions is it possible and then once you can find that out then you start talking about whether or not it's ethical and those other really important questions but I've been trying to write those in the last couple of weeks and it's really started to make me think about the the other side of the technology in terms of the way that it supports education both from an informational perspective which again has been my my work for a while now uh, and then also how much of that statistical information, but the fact that somebody is going to, has just got a gym membership is relevant from an institutional perspective, right? In the sense that that talks about some of their engagement with the university. Whereas if they cancel all of their memberships, stop being a member of any group, they start dropping out of everything else, then you've got some warning signs that maybe there's a kid in trouble. Might also mean that the kid has taken up skiing. But, wow, you know, that's part of your job. Yeah, yeah. Just trying to think my way through. And this, this fits in with, uh, you've heard George Siemens maybe talk about learning analytics. This is the sort of blood and guts of that process. It's saying, what it, we have this data anyway. And I'm certainly not trying to say that a student is simply a bunch of numbers compiled together. I mean, I'd be the last person to say that. But at the same time, in an institution where you have 5, 10, 20, 50,000 students, um, anything you can do to help connect those students who need them to real people who can help them is something I'm interested in at least exploring. Because what and we find, how would you answer Peggy's question of what do you think? Is this something we should be doing? And where do you draw the line? Hmm. It's a good question. Um, the 
to me, the line is drawn somewhere around where you start making decisions based on the data alone. Um, the data, to me, in the ways in which I'm interested in using it, is where it can help provide intervention information or support a student. So for instance, when you go and do an appeal, right? what happens is all this data actually does get pulled together. People actually do sit down and look at it. And then they may make an exception based on the whole picture of the data. So this happens anyway. But in this case, it only gets triggered by the fact that you failed at a school. right? So if we're using this data for this anyway, and if we can use it four months before, before you failed at a school and wasted your year, and if all it takes in a lot of cases, what we found, not necessarily academically, but in some other ways we do this, when we reach out to the students and go, hey, you know, you've been saying this on Twitter about the university, just want you to know we're here. Would you like to talk about that? Um, when we engage in that discussion, almost universally, the kids come back, we have a great discussion, we learn more about each other, and it's all good. Right? I mean, you and I have been doing this for years. The more you just talk about it, the more you just bring it up and talk about it, the better everything gets. So if that's true, and that's been our experience so far, so we've seen sort of, um, I wouldn't call them bullying situations, but situations where we've seen stuff and gone, that's out in the open. I'm not like prying into their emails here. So why don't we just, um, you know, see if it's obviously on campus, um, you know, because we have a certain responsibility towards those things, we think. Um, but as soon as you make the contact, kids go, oh, and then we have really productive discussions and that pulls it together. I think you can do the same thing from an academic perspective where in those larger groups, in those, you know, 4,500 students, which what we have is not a lot still, we have a lot of students who miss the safeguards because they don't know about them. A lot of our students are first in family, um, so they don't have, and if you get somebody who comes from a family that's three generations in a university, they know an awful lot about what supports are available to them that those first time people don't in such a such a way. So I think it can be really helpful. Um, and I assume uh, the only data that would be uh, analyzed would be university related data and or publicly posted data. You're that's not right. I would, if somebody said, would you track them off campus? Absolutely not. Um, it, like, actually, we make that distinction with Twitter. If you say, I'm on university campus and I just saw Dave Cormier and he sucks, we probably still wouldn't say anything about that. If you, you clearly identified this as a campus ish issue and you did something that was out of sync, we've had some, just some people doing some awkward stuff. We'll make comments. I had uh, staff members on campus talk about their jobs, for instance. And with the mistaken assumption, which so many people have, that Twitter is only viewable by the people who follow them. And that somehow there's some expectation of privacy there. And of course, we track the usage of UPEI and anything. So working at UPEI today had a client that was a super nice guy, let's say. I would give them a phone call and go, just so you know, this stuff is in the public. You know, so we do that kind of tracking too. So that's automatically tracked anyway. What about us. like Facebook? Well, because that involves friending. Um, we wouldn't be tracking anywhere where we've not been automatically and obviously included. So, for instance, there's a new student orientation page that we're involved with. If somebody posts on that page with stuff like that, then we consider it part of our network. So if you post on the UPEI page, the group page, we'll say something about it. Um, what you say anywhere else on the internet is not for us. We will occasionally notice that something nasty has happened, and we may take that and get that information to the people who need to know about it, so um, and, and help support that kind of stuff. But for the most part, yeah, not not really interested. Has there been any uh, opt-in, opt-out, proactive? Just want to let you know we're tracking this stuff. Kind of information oh, yeah. exchange with students. Yeah, we do. We let them know. Um, and most of the stuff, like when we, even when we talk to them, there's no record of that. We don't put it in a file anywhere or any of that stuff. We'll just sort of send an inconspicuous, just so you know, you know, this is out public. Maybe you didn't know, maybe you thought it was just your friends, but you know, this is the kind of thing that can have a, a, an impact on the way that people see you, that kind of stuff. 
And just to answer uh, Peggy's pretty... question, if they're tweeting bad comments about the faculty, if they say, oh, man, I have a cl course with that Cormier they're guy, why can't he welcome. just tell us what to do? I'm so tired of rhizomes. They're more than welcome to say whatever they want about the faculty in, a, in that kind of sense. If what they said was um, racist or um, threatening. Obvious, threatening, that kind of thing, um, we have a uh, student code of conduct on campus that they've all signed. So if it's in breach of the student code of conduct, and I don't mean subtly in breach, if you've gone way over the line, um, that triggers a series of things. If you've identified yourself as being on campus, um, then you have signed a code of conduct that you're in breach of. So we'll, we'll do something. And again, do something about it is usually, it's super student focused and it's about trying to explain to them what these things mean whenever they're brought out into the open like this. Um, so about faculty, we had, we've had some instances where faculty have said stuff um, about students, again, misunderstanding that Twitter is not private. They think of it as it is. And it's just, you know, it's an email back going, this is what you said. And here are, here's the discussion group that started by students to talk about the fact that you said this. This is how the internet works, <laughs> just so you know, you know. But that's really the approach we take. Um, Yeah, and student improprieties, I, I don't, I, I'm, I really want to be clear about that. The fact that you eat with a spoon instead of a fork is not of any, the stuff that we would address is way over the line. You know, we're not looking, people's opinions about stuff, I mean, you're welcome to, we, we had a student tweeting from Senate um, yesterday, Friday, which was hilarious. It wasn't particularly complimentary, but he's allowed not to like Senate. You know, nobody's saying that he's not, that he's supposed to have a good time there. As long as he's being, as long as he's, again, like you say, he's not attacking somebody or, you know. Senate, um, is that like student government stuff? Uh, no, Senate is, is um, every university, or I think it's every university, is governed by a Senate. And that Senate makes decisions about academic regulations, about what courses get authorized. And it's a mixture of the student body and the academic and administration. They all kind of work together to govern the rules of the academic rules of the organization. Um, so when you take that from a student, like I wouldn't have any interest in knowing what the content of your session with the writing tutor was. But the fact that you're going to a writing tutor gives me some information that might help. So if I see, if I see a student who starts to drop off and then I see that they've hit the, um, the supports on campus, I go, great. They're getting support. Maybe that works. Maybe it doesn't. But at least they've hit the safety net that's there. And then you come up with, to me, which is the only question about this, and I've been trying to find creative ways to present this to administration. They've not been unwilling to listen. It's just it's a big question. And that's where do we want to be as an institution on the scale of nanny state and Lord of the Flies, you know? So do you want to just set everybody fence for themselves? That's what university is. They're supposed to take care of themselves. And then over here, where every time a student doesn't make the class, somebody calls them up and asks them if they're OK, you know? And looking forward in, in, in university, like in, in formal education, um, I don't think the Lord of the Flies thing is going to work out. Because that's called the internet. <laughs> We've kind of got that already, you know. So I think that more and more we're going to have to decide what kind of supports we're interested in, in putting into place. And for me, I'm not sure if this analytic stuff is, is the right one. Um, but because of the review that's going on inside of my organization, if it's ever going to happen, it would have to happen now. So I'm trying to make sure that if the strategic decision is made that we're all about carrying that student forward and making sure they succeed, then we have as many tools in place to be able to make that happen as possible. Well, that's interesting. And if Steve K is the Steve K, I assume he is, mm -hmm. uh, I'd be interested in hearing his thoughts on how they deal with this at Virtual Learning Academy, New Hampshire's mm -hmm. first and finest online high school. Um, and, um, could... and Peggy, we, we're not making any of this data collection. Um, what I'm doing is asking the questions of the software vendors about whether or not it would be possible, um, which is a completely different 
yeah i would the the things that we would need to do to actually enact those policies would be two three years down the road we'd have to do referenda we'd have to do all of this stuff and, and there's a cost associated with this yeah huge huge costs but we're redoing our student infrastructure anyway um, so now's the time to consider it and sort of get a, a price quote or whatever and then you look at it and you go okay well these are the financial ramifications but what are the you know all the ethical ones that you need to deal with as well um, and that's um, the data collection quote unquote almost every piece of data that I'm talking about is being collected already so the university knows your grades the university knows whether if, if attendance is taken in track the university knows that if you're on a if you're on Moodle I know how many times you've logged in I know what links you've clicked I know you know I can send you um, a daily newsletter and find out whether you've opened it whether you've clicked on it. like all that stuff is information I could have um, it's just a question of whether or not you want to coordinate it and whether or not uh, you think it's um, whether or not you think it's important you know and whether or not you think it's a service you want to offer or policing you want to do. Now the policing is of no interest to me at all but if it's a service you can offer and the technology and knowing those things can actually help students succeed I think it's worth considering. Are and there universities that are further along this path oh, and are yes. using well, it? Well like I say in per at Purdue you have um, a, they call it the signals project and inside of your, your LMS you have a green, yellow, and red, and that tells you how you're succeeding, not based on, let's say there's 800 students taking basket weaving 203. It tells you where you are in that grouping. So if you're in green, you're fine. You're doing fine with the course. You're showing up enough. You're logging in enough times in the LMS, all those things. Uh, yellow, you should probably do something, like you need to make some changes. And red, essentially, you should be contacting support services in order to make sure that you're find some way to pass this course. And they've been doing that for a couple of years now. Um, you know, Athabasca is going down this road to some degree. So the University of Phoenix provides some of those services as well. But again, way easier for the online universities because, you know, how much, for just from your own experience, Jeff, and you've done a lot of stuff on the on the interwebs, how much and maybe you don't look at this stuff but you can tell how many times a student has opened a syllabus for instance if i look at a if i'm in a in an, if i'm looking at that and i see one student who's opened the syllabus 25 times i'm thinking either the student's a super keener or this student is really really grasping and not understanding what's going on when you take that piece of information and you cross reference it with their work or whatever else you can start finding out something about that student, particularly if they're not in front of you, that you wouldn't otherwise know. You know, I really, actually, if I could have one piece of information, it would be how many times the syllabuses are looked at. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I don't, I find that a really compelling sort of marker. I find that the students who regularly reopen them are usually the students who are engaged, who are like, Oh well, I should. What am I supposed to do with this yeah, again? Especially with your kind of course, you know. <laughs> That's what, right. what am I supposed to do? What's the assignment? What is he talking about? <laughs> What's he saying? Yeah. Um, so that was, I get the sense A of A, B, C, and D. Yeah, what well, going on? I'm having some great chats with the Swedish rhizome people. Um, I'll tell you, man, the MOOC is so much better for the presenter than it is for the students. I can't imagine having followed me through that week, but for me it was fantastic. I made all kinds of new connections. And it turns out there's a whole movement of rhizomatic learning in Sweden. How um, did you not connect with them before? I have no idea. Um, they do speak Swedish, which is a bit of an impediment. Um, their English is much, much better than my Swedish. Um, but they do um, some really, really, they made some really compelling in class classroom arguments about how the rhizomatic approach is the only way to compete against the traditional schooling movement. Um, and some really interesting work that they're doing there. Um, they've got, they've got a, that's a serious crowd of people over there. Um, we had some preliminary chatter today about maybe me going over. Um, I just hope they don't mean in January. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be a better time to visit Sweden. And no offense to my Swedish friends. It, I feel the same way about PEI. January is not the time to come. Um, but uh, 
pretty neat. And I mean, that's those that, that kind of weird, crazy change of connection stuff. You know, yeah. There's a whole bunch of people who are saying, who say, who started talking to me about the work that I've really not had a lot of feedback on over the years. I've had a lot of people taunt me about it. Um, I've had a lot of people go, what? But not a lot of honest to goodness. Hey, you know what? I see what you're saying, but what the what is this little dangly bit here? You know, and that's been fantastic. So how nice uh, you can lot. talk about your dangly bits with sweet people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, how's what about you, Jeff? Going? Um, I've been on the downslide there the last couple of weeks, and uh, hopefully we'll be picking back up this week. It's one of those things where the three of us slip and slide back in and out. One week Stephen's leading the show, and one week it's me leading the show. And uh, I think I burned out a little bit after uh, after doing that crazy week a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, I think you burned me out as well. I kind of holy taking smokes. a step back, and uh, and and it's just another week or two before things go on break. Christmas for, break, yeah. Um, oh yeah, that'll be good. Yeah, for sure. What about you, Jeffy? You're changing up. Um. Got, uh, uh, dealing with academic paperwork and booking plane tickets. I'll be going back to New Hampshire in February, which is just Yay. a time. But I'm going to pass through uh, Los Angeles and Las Vegas. I'll be in Vegas for the Super Bowl. Oh, okay. so, you no way. Yeah. Do you have the $5,000 you need to get in? Uh, they let you in the city for less than that. <laughs> I meant the Super Bowl. Oh. Your Patriots will probably be there. Oh, uh, well... I I am not going to the Super Bowl. I'm going to Vegas. Hmm. And Vegas is surprisingly cool in the winter. So anyway, I've been. Um, it would be lovely to see you, Peggy. I don't know if I can ask the plane to stop, but <laughs> just let me out here. Yeah, just. <laughs> it would be lovely to meet Peggy. Um. So, do I have anything ed techy to share? Not really. I could try to make stuff up, but uh, oh, I saw the Edu Blogs is happening. Edu Blogs. The awards. Yeah. Well, actually, the Cormier Awards have already come and gone. So I I enjoyed that uh, Twitter <laughs> meme. My yearly protest. Yeah. And and you had the same winner again. This year? Again, fourth, fourth year in a row, yeah. Yeah, surprise come from behind victory. And it's funny how many more people are Twitter literate now. The difference between this year and last year is dramatic for me because a whole bunch of people from Charlottetown engaged this time. So somebody put up Occupy Cormier Awards. That was a guy from my university. Um, and last year, I don't think I would have had a single comment back from anybody here. And it just goes to show how much deeper the penetration is now. Um, and from a, like Twitter and the way that it's sort of a lot of people, the, pe the people for whom Twitter works, and that's not everybody, but um, it's a cross-section of the population. I don't think of it as a particularly technological thing, much like um, texting isn't technological. It's just it suits some people better than others. Um, and for those people, like I got a lot of feedback from non-educational people, a couple of congratulations to people and from people that I had to then explain that I was joking. Um, <laughs> although most of them, most of them are people who follow me. So they sort of have that expectation that if I'm saying something, it's entirely possible. And then I got my logo from, um, uh, from Julia, the, Rise of Magic logo, which is now on my blog. That was that was what I was looking for, a graphic. I appreciate mm -hmm. that, Julia. Yeah, um, very are you going to be doing the end of the year awards again? Or not awards, I'll do the, but your... I'll do the top ten list. Yeah, it's been like six or seven years now. Yeah. Uh, seems a shame to, to stop now. Uh, although I'm not sure that I think it'll be... I'll continue that slide that I've been making away from technology and towards sort of broader educational things. But what can I say? I mean, that's that's the thing about this show, I think. And 
you know, the things that, that we used to talk about when we started it, the technology was changing and there was no no idea what was going to happen to it and what you could do with it. And now we've gotten to the point where, yeah, yeah, we know the technology can do that, but what, why are we doing this is really more the question. And, uh, you know, we spend far more of our time now. Uh, as much as we'd like to talk about tablets, that conversation never seems to happen, you know? Um, although I have to say that I'm pretty much settled. I'm going back to laptops. Why is that? I can't type on them. Do you have the keyboard accessory? No, but it just it doesn't feel right. I want a laptop. Yeah. You don't think so? No, I, I don't have a tablet. I've never had one as part of my life. Um, I think we may be getting one soon, I think, for my wife to play with. Uh, and I can see it useful as, you know, a mobile device. But I I think if you commute, it's fantastic. If yeah. I commuted, it would be wonderful. But I think I'm going to get a, um, uh, a MacBook Air 11 inch. Yeah, and the reason and I don't have one is I'm never far from a desktop. Yeah. Well, and what's happened to me in the last six months is I've gone from spending a lot of time in front of my computer to spending a lot of time in meetings. And I don't take the best notes. When I've got a piece of paper in front of me, I'm drawing little umbrellas and people dropping and rain and, oh, maybe a little tree. I'm like Bob Ross, except I'm not an artist. <laughs> Over here, we have a nice little tree. Yeah, that's me like you're in one long Illuminate session doodling. It's brutal. Yeah, I know. It's brutal. People look at my notebooks and they're like, what's that? And I go, okay, you see that guy over there, that thing there? That's the, that's the connection between the main website and the mobile website. And do you see how the guy is like in a demographer? He's going to get it shrunk? Well, that's what's in its drawing. It's all pictorial and stuff. But wow. they're, so they're barely recognizable. Doodles. Oh, they are. No, I know what they mean. Um, but yeah, they don't. The, the stories tend to take on a life of their own, and then I lose track of the discussion. That's not good. Whereas if I'm typing, I keep really good notes. All right. Um, anything else? No. I think that's what's going on, Jeff. All right. Well, we did a show. We did Wowza. We did. We did. It uh, works. We didn't break the internet. No. Nope. Internet's still not broken. All right. Well... Maybe I'll see you next week. Maybe. Get those slackers to join us. Them and their lives. Yeah. Family and football <laughs> games. And, uh, all right. Well, thanks, Peggy, as always, for being our number one audience member. Mm hmm And uh, others who joined us. And we'll see you whenever. <laughs> uh, cheers. Bye, Jeffy.